and technology being used. Um, people are trying to capture uh, everything from text to images right on their computer from the other side. Um, I, a couple years back, I had an online seance where uh, everyone sort of tuned in at the same time. And um, how did that work? Strange thing. It, strange things really did happen. Uh, it's funny when you do something over the internet. The internet is a perfect medium for any kind of occult phenomena to build and grow because, I mean, it is really. It's a network. It's, it's a way a lot of people can focus. Whenever you're doing something on a computer, it's very cerebral. It's, it's usually a good focuser of your attention. And um, it is sort of like holding hands at the world's biggest table. What do you recommend to someone who buys a house and finds out that there's something very strange going on here? It's haunted. What do they do? Well, I think the first thing they should do is try and figure out um, what, kinds of phenomena they're experiencing, try and really identify, is there anything malicious happening, or is it just sort of like recordings in the walls? I mean, a lot of hauntings are just really sort of silly. It'll be like a room that feels weird, and every once in a while you'll see something there, but it's not really particularly intelligent, or it doesn't really try and make contact with you. Sometimes it's almost like um, a tape recorder on a wall, really. Like, you'll walk in a room and you'll just hear something playing, essentially, over and over, and it doesn't really do anything. Your work that we're talking about tonight, and they're all incredible, uh, are they available on bookstores, Amazon.com? How do they obtain all these, you know, Summoning Spirits, which we'll yep. talk about next time? Uh, all your all books. Print. Um, yeah, they've all been in print uh, since they came out, which I'm pretty proud of. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Well, I guess the best way, then, if you go to, like, Amazon.com, is just to type in your last name. Uh, well, yeah, I just have one name. And all the books show up then. Yeah, if you just type in my first name, Constantino, they'll all come up. I like that name. <laughs> it's my real name. First name, last name? It's my real first name, and okay. I just dropped the last name. They ever call you Connie when you were a kid? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, look, you do a great job here, and I want to talk with you about the summoning up spirits when we come back, because on Wednesday, Constantino, so I'm going to do an experiment that I, I am beginning to have second thoughts about, and I yeah, want to your get, listeners are actually writing me about it, telling me to tell you not to do it. Well, we're going to, I'm <laughs> going to be very curious to see what you're going to tell me. But even before you do, let's find out more about what this Ouija board really is and uh, why it does what it's supposed to do. We'll be back in a moment, Summoning Spirits, next on Coast to Coast AM. A fascinating evening with an incredible person, Constantinos, our guest. In a moment, Summoning Spirits, the art of magical... Evocation. That's next on Coast to Coast AM. Constantino summoning spirits. Uh, you, you call it a very powerful magical act. For centuries, you believe that this has been a kept secret. Let's talk about that. Sure. Uh, magical evocation. I mean, it's something that we've seen in movies all through our lives. It's where the wizard or magician calls up a spirit to visible appearance and then commands it to do some uh, interesting task, usually something he doesn't want to do himself. Uh, what's interesting is it really works. Um, and it it's funny because it's the first book I wrote, and it was the first um, sort of magical practice I was very, very interested in. But after years of doing it, I realized that it, it all brings it together, um, my theories about psychodrama and how um, magic really works. When you try and evoke something to visible appearance, um, it's not necessarily coming from some other dimension. Uh, there's a chance it's coming from your own subconscious mind, mm -hmm. evoking it from yourself. But it doesn't really matter because psychodramatically, if you do it properly and in the right setting and you see this thing appear or think you see this thing appear, it really changes something in you and you get the result, yep. whether it's coming from you or not. You believe that there are 50 entities that you can summon up. Uh, are they all good? Are they evil? Uh, yeah, well, I, I selected 50 for the book. Um, so they, there's more? Oh, yeah, they come from various sources. Uh, the grimoires of the olden days, uh, like the Goetia, the like Lester K. Solomon, um, even some more recent uh, ones like the Necronomicon. They're basically entities and their sigils, and you call them up. And some of them are blatantly um, described as being malevolent. Some of them are described as being beneficial. And a lot of them are just eerily uh, neutral in like an alien sort of way. Like they don't really consider us um, as anything to be bothered with, really. So it's sort of um, a, an alien kind of distance that they have. 
And what's real interesting is it doesn't matter whether they're evil or beneficial. Um, once they are summoned and you have achieved that kind of magical state, if you want to call it that, you are in total control of the experience at that point. So now, now, why do you say it doesn't matter if they're evil or, or good? I mean, what if they are evil? I mean, uh, Okay, well, let's see. Um, a good example would be what if it turned out that some poison uh, could be used to cure a disease if applied a different way? All right. Something people considered was horrible for years and years. But if you harness it the right way and use it, there you go. Okay, here it is. Botox. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Botox in its form is not good, right? There you go. Yeah, where would Hollywood be without that? Exactly. So, <laughs> but, but they're able to play around with it, and it, it, it's something that works. Exactly. It's, it's a really powerful energy source. And not necessarily, again, I, I can't be certain as... I mean, I'm a rational thinker. I know it must sound crazy to people who hear that I'm an occultist, but I definitely do see the occult as a science. And something like this, I have yet to see empirical evidence that would prove to me that these spirits don't exist um, or do exist in one place or another. Like, are they out there? Are they in me? I can't tell. If I were to evoke a spirit and destroy it in a ritual, someone else could easily evoke the same spirit and it'll still come. Why do we want to even evoke a spirit? Uh, because it goes back to psychodrama. Um, if you are sitting in a room and trying to do something like a candle spell, uh, you'll take a candle, you'll visualize a goal, you'll light it, and you'll sit there and wonder if that did anything. Uh, some people will have doubt. They'll think it's too simple, it's too um, almost hokey, and nothing could really be happening. Why am I wasting my time? But when you do something like an evocation, and it works, and you see this thing, or you feel its presence in the room, or you hear its voice, or something like that, or you see the smoke um, from your incense burner shift and make a face, that is an experience you can't deny in your own personal reality at that moment. And it's such a strong experience that you don't bother worrying about whether or not this thing will do what you asked it to do. It has to. You just saw it. You saw the proof. So you sort of see the proof before you see the result of the ritual, and that's very powerful. And, of course, that leads us into the Ouija board. A tool, a toy, what is it? Uh, it's definitely a tool, and um, it sort of comes with my same theory about anything in the occult. I mean, anything could be used for good or evil. Um, there really is no such thing as inherently evil evil object or tool. Uh, you know, just like a saw can be used to cut wood or, I guess, cut someone's arm off. It's the same with a Ouija board. Uh, I personally think it's fine. Um, if, if it's done in the right setting, uh, it can be a great way to focus your intent and your uh, thoughts. However, one thing to watch out for is if you talk about something an awful lot and put it out there, and let people speculate about it and start to have thoughts about it. Sometimes the experimenter effect in the experiment can get out of hand. So there is a very real possibility that by publicizing something like a Ouija board show, you've invited a few million people's um, impressions into the mix, so to speak. Good or bad. Exactly. And it's hard to say which way the balance will shift. Uh, do I think the Ouija board's going to fly and stick to the wall and your head's going to start spinning? Probably not. <laughs> I could safely say that. Let's hope not. <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's talk about the board itself, the planchette, uh, the creation of it. I mean, sure. what is moving the planchette when three or four people have their fingertips on it? Okay, it's a difference in pressure um, based on the idiomotor responses of your muscles. Um, if you were to pick up a string with a weight attached to the end of it, a pendulum, you can get the same kind of effect by yourself. Um, it'll move one way or the other. Right, and we've done that a lot. Sure. But with a Ouija board, what's interesting is um, it's a bunch of people, and if they're all sincere and they all really don't try and move it, you're working on a group's idiomotor responses. So it's a bunch of people who are acting as antennae to pick up signals. Well, how could three people, though, Constantinos, all kind of push it, motor neuron or not, push it to, you know, let's say like an, a letter A or a D or something? Why isn't it in conflict? You know, each, each individual might be thinking of something else. Why does it always seem to flow, you know, in, in tandem? 
Well, when each individual is thinking of something else is usually at the very beginning, and that's when nothing really happens. Okay. But when people start to align with, like, ooh, let's talk to Jim Morrison or whatever, <laughs> yeah. which would be a good uh, teenage thing from years ago, uh, they do start to align. They do start to think about the same thing. And then what could be happening is everyone will tap into some current, some some contact, and the person to the right will feel that it has to go to B subconsciously, and they'll start to pull it. And the person to the left will feel it has to go to B and start to push it. They're not aware of it, but it's happening. How much of it is made-up desire by the individuals there or actually a tap in the Jim Morrison? <laughs> um, it's pretty impossible to say. Um, if you had a group of kids who in the right setting, and again, psychodrama comes into play. Sure. If it was like three in the morning and candles were burning and they were listening to creepy music or incense was burning, what would happen is you'd have the psychodrama. They would believe anything was possible. They'd all be locked in. Chances are they've already spent a few hours together and they've all sort of like synced up in their way of thinking. So who knows what's happening at that point? Those kids could very well just be wish-fulfilling and sort of having telepathy with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they could all want the same answer. And Very possible. Get it. Yeah. Or you'll have one that's not really even participating and just sort of letting it move along. And that could certainly happen, too. Why do some people then believe that the Ouija board is a portal? Opens it up to the dead, who the, uh, the because, evil dead. Well, because that's exactly what it's designed to be. <laughs> it's designed to be a portal. It's designed to be uh, something that makes it easier. And, of course, that scares some people. And Hollywood, of course, has a lot to do with this. You know, the only time a Ouija board's ever shown in a movie, you know, the planchette flies against the wall and little Reagan turns to, uh, you know, the, the demon, Pazuzu. Um, it, you never really see a Ouija board where the heroes use it to solve a crime or something. Right, it's fun. Yeah, yeah it's always this great dramatic event because everyone's seen it. And, I mean, it's inherently spooky. You've got this thing with letters on it, and it really shouldn't move, right? But it does. Thomas Edison tried to create a device to contact the dead before he died. Yep. Uh, individual's been on this program. He's created what is called Frank's Box. There's also another thing out there called the Spirit Com that apparently communicates with the dead. Is that possible? Any of that possible? Uh, well, it's communicating with something. Um, whether it's the dead or another intelligence of some other kind, uh, results are being achieved. Um, the latest rage now is trying to use other sensitive electronic devices to get real-time sort of uh, responses, like the K2 meter. It's a type of EL, um, EMF meter where um, it's so sensitive and it moves so quickly that you can sort of ask it questions, yes or no, kind of like with a pendulum. Uh, like flash once right. for no or two times for yes or something like that. Uh, I I can't see why it wouldn't be possible. I mean, that that's pure energy. It's yeah, it is, and energy. if it's created the right way. I mean, uh, you know, I think Tesla could have invented one had he lived. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not real sure if he was working on something like that. No, Kevin I don't think so. he was. But, uh, you know, Edison might have been. If anybody was going to be able to come up with anything, it might have been him. Yeah, assuming he wasn't lying, yeah, I, I do believe he was working on that, like he said. Well, you can look at his track record, you know, yeah. look what he's come up with. So if anyone turns on, um, you know, light switch and a dead voice comes out, maybe, you know, the inventions cross paths or something. Okay, you said something interesting about the Ouija board. You said that, you know, with the millions of people that listen to this program, that it could have an effect. I am not concerned at all about what's going to happen to me. Uh, you know, I think I'm strong enough energy-wise to combat a lot of that. But I'll tell you what's been happening in the last week or so, and I want to get your professional, truly professional uh, take on this. Things have been happening with people I know, people who've been in touch with me, people who have surrounded themselves around me. I mean, bizarre things. Some of them not very tragic, others very tragic. I mean, I had an archbishop on last week who told me, don't do this Ouija board show. And he went on to explain that uh, sometimes demons come at him during exorcisms and things like that. Well, he's going to be on the program for a little bit Wednesday night. He's had a horrible run since he's been on this program. He said he's never seen anything like this before. His family's been critically injured in car accidents. I mean, it's awful. Some of my family members have had some very strange things happen to it. I'm from St. Louis. I go back and forth 
Constantinos between Los Angeles and, and St. Louis. Saturday night, 200 people get stuck in the arch. I mean, if that's not an, because there's an electrical outage up there, that never happens. If that's not a sign that somebody's trying to play with me, I don't know what it is. Well, um, I mean, it is easy to to um, interpret events like that as an uh, intentional synchronicity, sure. Uh, it could have happened anyway. Uh, uh, sure. And also, um, I mean, there's a lot going on about this. This is probably the, your most highly publicized show of all time. Everyone has an opinion. Yes. I'm, I'm surprised people are writing me to tell you <laughs> not to do it. It's kind of- are, are you getting any telling you to talk me into continuing it? No, it seems like everyone's just afraid. Yeah. I don't know why. I mean, I've had a lot of people who said they're not even going to listen that night uh, because yeah. they're afraid. Well, that's Yeah, that's amazing to me. I mean, I've used it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about the Ouija board okay. maybe uh, remove some of it. You mean we can actually laugh about it? Uh, sure, yeah, right. definitely. Uh, growing up, my parents wanted to send me to private school, and the only ones nearby were Catholic school. Mm-hmm. And um, my parents were Greek Orthodox, so I thought it was kind of funny that I would have to go to Catholic school. But anyway, so I went to Catholic school. And I ended up in the priest's office a lot because I had questions that they didn't really want to talk about in front of the other kids in religion class. So I was always up there. Um, And one day we were talking about the occult, and he was doing his best to dissuade me from any interest in it. And I turned to leave. Uh, It was time to go to my next class. And behind his door, leaning up against the wall, was a Ouija board. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned to him, and I couldn't believe I said this and, and wasn't in trouble, but I turned to him and said, you hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you never held back, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. And he said to me, no, that, that's just a game. It's just a game for when, you know, uh, yeah. and he like sort of stammered and didn't really have a great answer, but I just thought that was really funny. Is it just a game? Uh, it could be, uh, but... It's just a game that, in the right setting, with the right intent, could quickly turn into something real. It could be positive or it could be negative. Um, again, with the occult, anything goes. Um, it's just like anything else. You, you have to approach each thing with, its, with the respect it deserves. And, you know, I believe there's e- evil demonic spirits. Uh, you know, I know they're there, e- either in another dimension, in hell, wherever they may be, I know they're there. I mean, are they looking at this Wednesday night as a, as a field day? Are they saying, this is our moment, this guy's going to open up the door for us, and we're all coming through? Well, how many do you think could come through? I don't know. I mean, it's only going to be one set of hands on one planchette. Well, I've got a couple other people that are going to be in there with me, but the, the sure, point but... is, is what happens if, I mean, are millions of people who are listening to the program, are they contributing to that portal? Definitely. I think See, they're that's all what's bothering be. me. But what it might, it could end up going really, really um, spectacularly, or it or, could end up being a, a big, confused mess with so many people vying to get their input yeah. onto what your planchette spells out. Um, I know I'm. It could be disturbed. gibberish. It could be. It could very well be. You were talking about interference before. This would be a great example. I mean, so are there a bunch of things trying to get out? Sure, maybe, but. They might not even have a shot because they're paranoid um, people writing me as we speak. In your, in your opinion, <laughs> see, so it sounds like you're telling me to go ahead with it. Definitely. I think if you take some precautions to, to focus your intent on what you want to accomplish, you're the one who's there. You're the experimenter. You're the closest to it. Um, I, I think if, if done with that kind of uh, careful preparation, it'll be just fine. Do you think, though, that someone out there could get affected by this in their own way? I think if anything like that happens, it's because there's a whole lot of people speculating about that. I really don't think it has anything to do with the board. At this point, I think if you were to just go off the air for 10 minutes and say you're doing it in private, any weirdness that would have happened will still happen. Right. And even if you didn't even touch the Ouija board, I think people are just going to project and and sort of create their own realities there. What's fascinating is the, the camp of experts, yourself included, who are cut right down the line on this. I mean, there are some who are telling me, go ahead with it, nothing's going to happen, we like this, good for you. 
there are others who are saying, you know, and I mean some profile guests we've had on this thing. I mean, they, they're, they're frightened to death about this. It's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it skews both ends. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I could see that. It is one of those polarizing types of uh, devices. I, I've definitely seen people freak out or get excited. Um, uh, what kind of precautions are you going to take? I've got a, a, an expert who's coming in to say a few prayers, who wants to sprinkle things around me. <laughs> uh, I've got another uh, expert who is uh, an expert on the occult, uh, like you are. Uh, we've got another one who is a staunch believer that it's the individual, not the board, that has the ability to create this and summon spirits. Um and, and 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 myself, uh, Constantinos. I mean, I have always I felt surrounded myself uh, around light or light surrounding me. I mean, I've never felt to be one of those negative energy people. I'm not concerned about me. Uh, what I'm concerned about now is everybody else. I mean, these bizarre things that are starting to happen to people before this thing even occurs. And like you say, it might have happened anyway, but. It's to me. It's just weird. The synchronicity and the timing is weird. It is. Um, you might want to consider having some of those people who things are happening to, or anyone who's afraid in your own personal life, um, share with you what they really think about the Ouija board, and have them think along those lines. Um, to give you an example, that night, have those people basically say. Um, you know, with firm intent that it's an interesting experiment and they wish you well with it, you know. I mean, the person who's closest to it will always have the greatest impact. So if they say something like that, it'll sort of dispel all the, you know, bad vibes coming out of this thing. Because remember, it's just it's just a tool used for that one right. act. Have you ever talked to the dead? In what way? Uh, through any kind of device or anything uh, like that? Yeah. Well, let's I, I've, gotten, I've gotten results that I couldn't, um, just ignore. All right, let's talk about that when we come back. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. If you want to pick up the After Dark newsletter, you get 14 issues for the price of 12. You can call one 727 5505 Makes a great gift for someone who just loves to read about the strange and unusual stories. one 727 5505 or go online at coasttocoastam.com. Constantinos, what do you think it's like on the other side? Uh, well, from the little snippets that uh, I've received and others have received, uh, the things that do make contact with us um, seem to imply that it's definitely a place uh, where thought rules all, um, a place of like wish fulfillment and where what they think creates reality. And I guess it kind of makes sense because if you were out of body permanently like that, your mind would be unfettered and um, unhindered by physical material which gets in the way. You were going to give us a result or two. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the most uh, powerful experiences I ever had was one I didn't even expect to happen. Uh, I was younger, and it was the big day of Hurricane Gloria uh, in the Northeast. And I was at my aunt's house, and we got a phone call. And I thought it was just going to be that school was canceled, but it was actually that my grandfather passed away at uh, the hospital. And uh, I was sitting in the backyard looking into the pool uh, that they had, and it was getting kind of dark, overcast. And there was an electric bug light across the way, and it was creating an odd kind of illumination on the pool. And I didn't really get at the time uh, what was happening, but... That illumination is something I understand a little better now, and I'll talk about in a minute with scrying. Okay. But what happened was the pool started to sort of change its color. It became deeper and blacker, and I saw my grandfather literally move out of it and come toward me. And he spoke to me for a few minutes, and he wouldn't let me go near him, and then he just vanished. And that was that was pretty uh, powerful experience that I couldn't deny. I mean, it was literally broad daylight except for the clouds that were coming in over uh, the horizon. Yes. And I wasn't asleep in any way. I mean, I wasn't sleeping in the backyard. I was <laughs> sitting out there looking at the pool, and it was startling. And later on, I, I understood a little more about the whole scrying experience. And 
how to get something like that to work, you really need to have a light source that sort of indirectly illuminates a surface like a, a bowl full of ink or, or a crystal ball on a black cloth or something. Did it reinforce anything for you, a belief system that might have been already there? Absolutely. Uh, I, I had been already looking into things for years, and it just cemented it for me. There was, there was no turning back after that. That was probably the clearest point where I knew that it wasn't all just stories. The, the quest for learning more about the dead, I think, is, is something that everybody goes through. Uh, a very sad story just a few days ago, a television anchorman and radio host in uh, San Francisco by the name of Pete Wilson. Um, he goes in to get his hip replaced, and he dies of a massive heart attack. I mean, gone. I guess, you know, when you when you pass on like that, uh, you know, from an operating table experience, what do you think happens to them? I mean, are they confused? There's, yeah, there's definitely that belief. And I've seen evidence that there is some kind of um, what's known as like transit confusion. Um, there's that period of time uh, right after death where it's not clear what happens, but it seems that there's a very easy chance for um, a person to become confused by uh, thought forms and things that they're clinging to from life, um, things that they built up around them, uh, certain dramas. If it's a sudden death, they, they seem to be confused by where they are. Uh, there's an old practice where um, uh, a particular uh, group of monks actually tap on the head of someone who just died to remind them that the, what they're seeing is all illusion. That uh, hmm. what's happening to their uh, <laughs> spirit isn't really happening. It's it's just um, illusion, and they should move on. So you do get sort of like confused messages from time to time, and when people ID them as the voice of someone recently dead, it it becomes clear that something like that could be happening. You know, in some of the stories I hear, uh, absolutely staggering from police officers, emergency medical service folks, people who experience death on a regular basis, hospital workers, you know, they see the ectoplasm leaving a body, or in, in one case, I love to relate this story, you know, the officers uh, received a call that uh, someone was having a heart attack. So they go to the house, they knock on a door, a little old man opens the door for them, and they look in and see another little old man lying on his, uh, on his face, on his stomach, they, you know, roll him over, and they're ready to call 911. He's already dead, and it's the little old man who let him in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible. Or, you know, an EMT called me once in St. Louis. She had stopped at the side of a road. Uh, she was just driving. She wasn't even in an uh, ambulance. And uh, there was a person who was uh, flung from his vehicle and was lying dying on the side of the road. And she ran up to him, and she was the only one there at the time. She's looking around. There's no help, and she's trying to help this person. All of a sudden, she spots another person across the road, and she's just saying, please call for help. Do you have a cell phone? Call for help. This person just kept staring at her, did nothing. She looked back, and it was the same individual, same clothes, same everything, because she looked back again. The person was gone. So she must have seen somehow the spirit of this person who had died just hanging around yeah apparitions of the um of the living uh, that was one of the first real studies uh, that the psychic uh, research societies did back in the day we're talking when it was like a gentleman's type of uh, uh research they would they would look into cases where um people would reach out in those panic moments when they were near death or actually just had died and appear to someone far away and yeah, I mean, certainly think about it. What's what's more dramatic um, and and powerful a moment than when you realize that you're you're dying or you're you're desperately trying not to? Um, if ever there was a moment where your consciousness can reach out and scream and try and get attention, that's certainly it. Nocturna Con, one of your new books. Tell me about that. That book. Um, <laughs> that book I wrote because. I started to realize that every once in a while to get extreme results, you have to take extreme action. It's a little scary, i got to tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's definitely not your warm and fuzzy occult book. No. Uh, you know, you're not going to find it at the Hallmark store anytime soon. Um, <laughs> it won't be in a card to send to your dear friends. Yeah, no. 
Well, Nocturnicon, um, it, it definitely moves away from any uh, religious connection. It, it's all about getting results through extreme psychodrama. And a lot of my work definitely taps into the dark side. Um, there are certain people who just resonate better with the dark side. They, they don't like things that have a cheery sort of vibe. Well, and I've got to tell you, looking at it for a moment, cause, because I was looking at all of the books that you sent me, and then as I was getting to this one, I, I had seen like a metamorphosis change in you, and I was thinking that maybe, i I, I got to tell you, I thought maybe you were possessed when you wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think actually I was uh, definitely inspired when I wrote it, and I think what inspired me might have even saved my life. Um, when Before I started working on this book, I, I had a very uh, serious um, uh, phenomena in my brain, uh, so to speak. It, it was basically a large malformed vein, uh, venous angioma. So a severe medical s- situation. Yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, it just was getting worse and worse, and it was uh, really slowing me down. It was causing, like, numbness in the full side of my body. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was It was just really bad. Now, how old are you, by the way? Oh, I'm, I'm 34. God, you're a kid, <laughs> compared to me. And, uh, well, I, I didn't think I was going to get any older uh, when this was happening. <laughs> And I, uh, I was unable to even try and do something like uh, a ritualistic aid or something right. like positive thinking. It was just I was too wiped all the time. And during this period of time, uh, I definitely did start getting uh, information from a source, a definite uh, intelligence outside of my own. And it came to me in very clear ways. And, I mean... He did identify himself as a name that would probably freak out some of your listeners. But when he said the name, it made perfect sense to me because I know the etymology of the word. And he said his name was Lucifer. Oh, no. Yeah, but he said pretty much uh, straight up that he was indeed a light bearer. I mean, he made it clear that he was just going to bring some wisdom. And he suggested trying a few forms of extreme psychodrama rituals that would really sort of make me wake up and take notice of what I was doing, even though I felt half paralyzed at the time. It was a trick. Uh, Well, it worked. You didn't sell your soul, did you? No, I didn't have to. (laughs) Because he never identified himself as something that you could sell a soul to. He literally told me he was only going to stick around long enough to pass along some insight. Now, was he something I just created as a needed psychodrama? It's certainly possible. But it worked. I tried things I would have never thought of trying before. And most of what I tried, I put in Nocturnicon in ways that people can apply to whatever they want to apply. Do you think you were visited because this entity, Lucifer, wanted to pass information on to you or maybe was interested in you? I really can't say. It was such, I don't know, like a deep spiral that I had fallen into that I, I definitely believe I had reached out for something, for anything at that point. Yeah, but why don't people reach out for the godliness part of it, you know? Well, because um, in all my years of, of working with the occult, I've, I've seen immediate results by reaching out for things that are aspects of what you're looking for. Um, if you just pray to God, it's very hard to focus on the needed aspect. So if you need help with money or something and you say, God, help me, really you're blasting out to the widest possible scatter shot. You're not really focusing on an aspect. That's why some of the pagan divinities are um, so effective when people uh, focus on a name, a God form, something that represents a very specific need. They get better results because they, they better resonate or tune in. Just like uh, I don't know. What was the deal? What did he want from you? Nothing. Are you sure? He wanted me to try some of the stuff that uh, he suggested. Did you? I sure did. And um, if you do a nice MRI in my brain now, you'll find nothing except uh, occult knowledge. Now, (laughs) So maybe he wants you around for some reason. Well, he hasn't reached out since that, and it's been a few years. I really honestly don't believe he's uh, some... Uh, truly, truly external intelligence. I think he was a form of uh, like higher consciousness that I pulled together in a form that would make me wake up and take notice, in a form of something.
something I didn't necessarily call, something I haven't called before, with an appearance I wasn't expecting, that kind of thing. Because it worked. I did take notice. I didn't mistake it for a dream or something like that. Of course, he was numero uno fallen angel. Um, do you... uh, it depends on your source material. Um, you know, sometimes, I mean, that name, what does it really mean? I mean, it, it, that name sort of describes... I got to tell you, I hate his name. It scares me. It, it, you know, when I say scared, I don't mean scared in a point where I'm running away hiding. It's just, it is a scary name. Uh, I mean, I the etymology of it isn't really scary to me. I mean, it just means light bearer, someone who brought wisdom. You know, and, and the Bible, I mean, it's not really clear on what the fall is, right? That stuff came later. And most of what people know about uh, fallen angels comes from drama and not from the Bible, like... Uh, from Paradise Lost or something like that. <laughs> Lucifer became this anti-heroic hero in that story, but let's remember that was a, you know, a play. Or, I mean, Where does Satan fit into all of this? Well, the word really just means opposer, just enemy. Um, Satan sort of used as, as an enemy. The, the first appearances of the word in the Bible don't even mean a proper name. Um, I forget where, but the first time it appears, uh, Satan just means an opposer. Like a lowercase yeah. s. You know, I, I also isn't it Arabic also Satan and yeah, it, it's just the idea that um, you're something that stands in my way, and eventually it became personified. Uh, lots of things, good and bad, have a way of becoming personified over time. Um, certain cultures personify death with a capital D. Some personify the enemy with a capital letter as well. But he was never Lucifer. Well, I don't people, think. I people think will jumble was... them together, and it depends on what you believe. I mean, if you believe that demons exist in a definite hierarchy and their names were there before we were, then you can argue that they're still distinct entities and they've taken on different roles. But if you believe that mankind has a way of sort of creating their own beings and assigning them names and then watching them grow in reality, then he's whatever a certain group of people want him to be. Truly, there are magical groups that actually create their own beings and keep them as sort of like uh, thought form group thought forms called egregores. They're like power batteries that they they keep on hand, and these things do start to manifest because so many people focus their intent on them. Uh, one of them was from the an old Germanic occult order, the Brotherhood of Saturn. Uh, the Gotos was uh, his name. And it's interesting because they, the person who created him for the group was Albin Grau, and he was actually the designer for uh, the movie Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the... A hideous um, character, by the way. That was, so that was a really creepy-looking guy, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what the Gotos looked like, the bald head, the pointy ears, and the sort of, like, uh, spooky eyes. And um, Albin Grau's bust of this thing was definitely made manifest by the group. And to this day, people, if they try tapping into that current, will have experiences with Gotos. Uh, <laughs> at the, it's funny, when I was, uh, I guess not funny to some people, but when I was uh, submitting the manuscript for Nocturnicon to my publisher, my editor and my copywriter for the back cover copy, who's actually now my publicist, <laughs> she, uh, they both uh, experienced uh, firsthand the, the presence of Gotos when they started just thinking about him. Man. It's kind of interesting. Got to hold you back, Constantino, so they don't get you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here you are giving me this great Ouija board advice. Uh, they're out there. I mean, haven't they tried to get you, those um, spirits? I've definitely, yeah, I've definitely felt um, malicious intent from possibly things that were on their own and possibly things that were directed my way. Did it ever slightly really worry me? No. Because when you work with this stuff so much, you start to just get a sense for how it all works. You start to get a sense for the power of even one crisp thought over a bunch of scattered ones. And things like psychic attack and stuff like that, that doesn't even slightly scare me. At all? No. Because it, it, it's directed, if it was directed by someone toward me, why would they be any more efficient at directing me than I would be at deflecting it? It's all the same stuff. It's like, it's like two black belts walking into a ring. I mean, mostly it's just going to be parries and blocks. So you don't uh, go to sleep with garlic around your neck? Or <laughs> no. Yeah, that's Definitely something. Not. But, you know, the, the book, uh, Nocturnicon, uh, 
it's a little different from the other ones. I mean, this is almost like a training guide. Uh, it is. Um, but the thing is, it's not uh, part of a bigger system that you have to follow. It's not like uh, you have to join some cult or something. Uh, and there is a distinction, of course, between cult and occult. <laughs> um, a cult is just a group of followers, and the occult is a study of the unknown. This book is um, its the most like a technology, really, because you can pick it up and start to read it to learn a little bit about psychodrama and how it affects your results in a magical working. And then you could basically flip to anything in the book and just try it, and you will get results because... Like I said, it's it's psychodrama to the nth degree. It's it's definitely designed to be dramatic and get you to get results. Is it magic? It is, but I mean, you know, there's the great quote like uh, about how one technology will look like magic to a more primitive culture. Uh, I think that's what's the case here. Um, even though Nocturnicon is as dressed up as it gets because of the psychodramatic theories I have. I think it's very scientific. Um, ultimately, I mean, I know this is going to sound funny after everything we've talked about tonight, but I really don't have much interest in occult research that can't be tied in to something that I feel is being also done in science. It doesn't really interest me if it's that far-fetched from me, because it doesn't seem possible, even to me. Like, I look at what's going on in the real serious work in quantum mechanics today, and I feel like they are finally starting to explain things that the ancients understood as something else. That's fascinating. Good work for you, by the way. Stay with us. Let's take phone calls when we come back. You ready for that? Yep, definitely. All right. We'll be back in a second. Don't go away. With our guest tonight, Constantinos. He's an expert in the occult. We'll be back with him in a moment. And then we'll take the rest of your phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie, Constantinos, our guest. His website, of course, is Constantinos with a K dot com, linked up at Coast to Coast AM dot com. I've got to ask you this. Uh, the name Lucifer, you know, as we talked about, scares some people. Uh, you were recommending I go ahead with the Ouija board show. How do I know it's not a trick from the other side? <laughs> Yes, I, I came into being just to trick you up. For uh, this yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta ask. <laughs> All these years I was planning for this moment. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little devilish laugh. You could be the perfect servant there. I'm not going to get an answer out of you on that, am I? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just kidding around. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a servant of anyone. <laughs> not out to get me. No. All right, to the phones we go, west of the Rockies. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Hey, how you doing? Good. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Outwater, California. Okay, good. Go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, it seems like uh, there's a lot of power to tap into, and uh, I was wondering if maybe the uh, military or governments, uh, if you know, if they would use this uh, type of thing to uh, get uh, information or power, you know, things like of that sort. Uh, they already have. Um, tried it. I mean, it's it's pretty much common knowledge. There were there were groups dedicated to things like remote viewing experiments sure. and and stuff like that. Um, my cousin was actually um, in the army, and he told me about some things he kind of witnessed in a Desert Storm that were a little little eerie. I'm not really at liberty to talk about them, but but he saw some things out there that made it seem like maybe. Just maybe there's still a little bit of effort being applied. Still going on. Yeah. And I had one more uh, question sure. for you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, now when, when these people uh, believe that they're talking, like uh, you see these psychics on TV and stuff like the Montel Williams show or whatnot, and they start talking to these dead relatives and people, I mean, are those truly dead beings or dead people, or, or is that like demonic spirits that they're talking to? Because it's like, uh, you know, a lot of people believe that they say that, you know, the dead know nothing, like they're as if they're in a sleep, like there is no um, eternal life. So I was wondering if, you know, are you really talking to dead people or, or if these psychics are talking to demons or spirits? Well, I mean, if, if you believe that demons and um, other intelligences exist, and it's, it's really not so far-fetched to believe that when the intelligences that we're all exhibiting while alive can carry on after we die, right? I mean, we're seeing that there is some kind of energy here. 
uh, just you know, point to your head and show me exactly where your mind is. You can't really point to it. Your brain's there, but your mind is something else. And it's that something that could very well go on. So uh, bringing up the people on TV, though, a lot of times I think who they're talking to is just their own talent at cold reading. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that's done for cameras on demand, it never fails. Did you ever notice that? It's kind of suspicious to me. Very suspicious. Okay, thanks. Appreciate your call. First time thanks. caller line. You're on the air. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Mario. I'm calling from Albuquerque. Okay. Um, what's it called? I have a question. Basically, I'm wondering how can you differentiate whether it's an actual entity like a spiritual, some like um, versus something that's more like psychokinesis, um, and something that's being manifested by by someone doing a psychic attack on somebody. Yeah, you can't always tell, um, and a lot of times it doesn't really matter because if if what you do. Uh, to stop it works, then it works, right? So it doesn't matter. Like in, in Vampires They Call Truth, I give examples of how to protect yourself from psychic attack. Now, is it a vampire attacking you, or is it someone doing a spell on you, or is it something else? It doesn't really matter as long as the result is the same. So you can't always really tell because there isn't enough evidence to analyze it. Um, and, I mean, look at me, for example. I've I've done things like evocations for years now, um, and I still can't say with any scientific certainty whether what I'm communicating with exists outside of my own mind or not. And like I, right. I mentioned before, it doesn't like really matter. You're manifesting a preconceived notion. Yeah, the, if, as long as you get a result, it doesn't really matter, which is right. really what it's all about. Um, also, just um, just what what. Is, do you believe there's a final authority to say what is malevolent or malevolent, like, or or how can we say that these Goetia or these these grimoires that exist, um, and they're saying, okay, well, these are fallen angels and these are demons or or whatever you want to call, how, who's to say that that's that's accurate? Yeah, there there definitely can't be an authority. Uh, there, there could be someone. There could be fallacious uh, information that's been out there. Yeah, I mean, it, it really could just be made-up names, you know. I mean, I've seen it. I, I've shown people how to do it, how to create um, a manufactured being, um, an egregore, how to just will something into being and evoke it, just like something that you found in an old musty book. And it works exactly the same. Once you learn how to do it, something that you sketched out on a piece of paper, made a name for, and drew a magical symbol to represent it, if you believe it and then you do the ritual, it comes to you just the same way. Constantinos, when you summon up a spirit, uh, will that spirit always show up, assuming, you know, everyone's the real deal? Uh, if you train your mind to, um, to enter that state, that psychodramatic altered state of awareness, if you learn all the techniques and practice, once you've got that down, it'll always show up in some form or other. It will? Yeah. All right. It's, it's just... Um, it just always happens that way. Yeah. If if you've got it down, it'll always work. Wild card line, it's your turn. Hi there. Hi. Yes, where are you calling from? Dayton, Ohio. Okay, take it away. Oh, it's an honor, George. I really love you guys. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a I have a question for Constantino. Mm -hmm. I hope I said your name right, sir. If I didn't, please forgive me. Well, add an add, add an S to the end of it, Constantino. <laughs> well, I'm very sorry about that. I'm really nervous. I, I had an experience. I'm 45 right now, and it was probably about 20 years ago. I was probably about 23. Um, I had a, had a run-in with a Satan worshiper, and you would have never really known that's what he was. But And when you say run-in, what do you mean by that? Well, I was really stupid. I, oh, I sort of prayed to like, God one time and asked him, to show me what evil was, and he did. <laughs> Would you have a relationship with him? No, oh, no, nothing okay. like that. He, I was a, I was a 4-H advisor, and he was in with the kids, and I was in college at that time and taking a Morris class, and the question was, would you do what's right? You know, something, if people would laugh at you and think you're silly, would you tell the truth and stop this? And at the time, I was a 4-H advisor, and... Well, I, he showed me really what he was. How did he do know. that? How did he show you that? Well, he, he, I was 
I was at a 4-H thing with horses, and he asked me, we were out there with all the kids, and it was like about 11 o'clock at night, and he asked me, um, who, do, who do I believe in? And I said, well, God, of course. And he laughed, and I had all these kids with me, and he said, who do you worship? And I said, well, God. And then he went into Satanism, and he invoked names, which I can't remember. And he told me how, you know, you can control animals' minds. It takes two people, one of them right there and then another one somewhere else. And I felt something, and I said, something's out there. And I had all these little kids with me, like 10-year-olds, and I was 24, 22, between 22, 24. And I said, something's out there. And he turned, and we had a flashlight, and he turned the light on, and it was this black cat. And it was coming straight at me, and I was like, oh, it's just a black cat. You know, I have a black cat at home. And he kicked at it, it clawed at him, and it screamed, and it ran away. And he turned the light out, and he looked at me and again, he, again, and he said, who do you worship, Jesus or Satan? And I said, well, Jesus, God. And I said, something's out there. It was that stupid black cat coming at me again when he turned the flashlight on. I haven't told anyone this, you know. I sort of live with this because I thought people would think I'm really nuts. It happened like three times, and I realized what was going on, and the ki- the little kids went running and screaming. And I looked at him, and I said, I know who you worship, and I know what you are. I said, I believe in God, and Jesus Christ is my Savior. Turn your light on your cat's back. And then, you know, I sort of went in back in where we were having a camp out and lay down and it was like this black cat came up and was hitting this window screaming. And I sound stupid, but it actually happened. Well, and um, he, he had a girlfriend that was laying, you know, sleeping, camping out. So I, I think what was going on was they were working in, in conjunction with it, kinda, with each other. Kind of bizarre that he works with kids. <laughs> Constantino. Well, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like the the animal thing was a uh, an act. I mean, to to get your attention. But it's interesting that did he identify himself as a Satan worshiper or a Satanist? Did you remember the he, distinction? He, he didn't say that. But when I told him, well, when I realized what was going on, and I was really afraid. And at that time in um, Dayton, Ohio, or it was Champaign County. There was a lot of um, Satan worshiping going on and animals being sacrificed. And I don't don't know all of it, but I got this feeling like he wanted me to run. Well, the thing with um, with Satan worship is it's it's not really the way the media portrayed it over the years ago. I mean, there were many studies done that have proven that all those um, alleged Satanic ritual abuses never occurred. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you added up all the people who supposedly had it happen to them, there would have to be like 400 million Satanists practicing in America that were, you know, yeah. kidnapping kids. It just doesn't happen. A real Satanist actually doesn't even believe in the devil. Um, a real Satanist is a person who believes in the strength of the ego. Uh, if you look into the teachings of, like, Satanism, it's not really all that mystical. It's more about um, dominant will and uh, a kind of like a worship of the self. Um, there's There's very little... Um, mysticism in it. There is some magic in it, um, and willpower, and, and creating um, reality too. But it's not like like the way Hollywood will make it uh, seem. It's not like the old Dennis Wheatley novels, uh, where uh, Satanists are kidnapping people and all that sort of thing. So you don't think though there are, there are groups that say go out there and collect the ear of somebody or this or that? Um, it, you mean like to perform some kind of necromantic uh, yeah. ritual? Well, sure. Yeah, there, there's definitely. There's definitely power there. Um, I mean, there's some severe cults out there. Sure, and and whenever they go to extremes like that, it's usually just to, I guess, sort of get off. It it, it brings them to a place where they're charged and excited, and and anything can happen. Like serial killers, almost. Like, Excuse me. Like a serial killer, almost. Uh, it, I mean, in a stranger way. It could be uh, serial killer. Sure, I mean they take it to a different kind of extreme, but they don't necessarily believe that anything mystical is going to happen. Serial killers are just, you know, psychopathic and disturbed. Wild card line, your turn. You're on with Constantinos on Coast to Coast. 
Good morning, George. This is Mike from Clearwater. Hi, Mike. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let your producer know that, uh, no, I don't have anything against him, which leads to my question. Um, if a person knows what they're doing and they're trained to do it, can you harness the dark power to get back at somebody? And, and don't take this the wrong way, but I'll use this as an example, George. If, if Say I didn't like you. If I knew what I was doing, could I conjure up a spirit or a or a demon or whatever it is and instruct it and say, you know, go to George and, and wreak havoc in his life? Is that possible? Or Well, I, I and I'm going to let you answer this, Constantinos, but based on my experience, it is possible. Yeah, but if, if, if the person that is getting the brunt of it also has the ability to shield himself, nothing's going to happen. Exactly. Um, it, it's all fighting with the same stuff, so to speak. Um, I've yet to see someone summon a spirit and then have this thing appear in, like, public and frighten a village. You know, it, it doesn't happen that way. Just because you summoned a spirit in your own mind and saw it and went through that experience doesn't mean that anything other than just pure intent and energy blasts out in the universe, so to speak. Uh, the same as if you just sort of... Um, have the ability to enter an altered state of awareness and, and really focus your will on something. Um, so the other person has the very same ability to focus their will on bouncing that right back. So what could end up happening is, is a very self-destructive process. I mean, you could become so obsessed with, with talking to these things that are malevolent and uh, malevolent in your own awareness of them that they will end up seemingly um, acting malevolent towards you. You're not going to send any like a, bad vibes like my way, Michael, are you? Huh? You're not going to send any bad vibes my way. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Okay. But then, so basically, if I get this correct before I leave, the, the guest is saying if, if I send something out, then somebody, can, like a ping pong table, they can send it right back to me. Yep. And it could wreak havoc in my life. It sure could. And because you might end up becoming obsessed with the act itself, you might just end up um, sending stuff your own way. Uh, anytime you have doubt about something, you might build up something like a fear that this thing will come and get you, and because you built that fear, it very well might. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, George. Thanks. I did an experiment, Constantino, some time ago on negative energy, and you are so correct. <laughs> it comes back, and uh, that's an experiment I don't want to try again. No, it, it, it works, but it comes back and hits you. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, my gosh. Hi. What do we do? We caught you napping or what? Well, where'd you say the Rockies? <laughs> yeah, you're on West of the Rockies. <laughs> Great. Where are you calling from? Huntingburg, Indiana. Well, how did you do this? Uh, you know what? Are you on I, XM? Yes, I am. That's why. That's what I they have the number so many is. people tell me that I need to listen to your show because of uh, my beliefs. But okay, anyway... I heard you guys talking earlier about um, spirits or whatever you want to call them, maybe manipulating a phone. Uh, Constantinos gave uh, an example of 111 as a phone number. The day after my really, really good friend died, I got three days in a row a call from 999 and I happened to be home those three days because I was in the middle of getting a job. On Friday, it didn't happen because I wasn't here. The three days I was here, it happened continuously and at different times, but I researched it. I <laughs> looked on the Internet, you know, called 911, uh, all those kind of things to try to find the phone number, and it, it's not existent. So how can you explain that? Well, um huh. Something like a phone display is, is, in a sense, a very simple circuit. I mean, it, it's got its own logic that's set up to decode electrical impulses and turn them into turn tones into numbers. So, if if you believe that the dead or or spiritual energies can influence tape recordings and things like that, influencing the tones to make numbers appear would be pretty much trivial, right? I mean, right. So, so it is possible. I mean. Of course, things like that could also just be a malfunction. <laughs> but if um, if other phenomena occur alongside of that, then you could start to take all that together and, and start to consider whether something else is occurring. Well, I, I talked to his mother 
the day after this happened because I wanted to share it with her. Mm-hmm. And she told me that his wife had a cell phone message recreated on her phone from months ago that was deleted by her from her husband that just basically said, I love you, and I'll see you soon. So that message came back on her cell phone after he passed away. Well, that's definitely one I haven't heard before. <laughs> yeah, she got the same message again that's after so it was easy. deleted probably four months before he died. There is a magic to this, Constantinos. Yeah, definitely. I, I've seen lots of different examples of this. Um, I've seen messages end up on people's computers, uh, which is which is really interesting. What about emails? Are the spirits sending emails at all? I haven't I haven't seen an email yet, but I have seen uh, a text file appear. But really? Yeah. I'd love to see what the emails would look like. I wonder what the return address would be. It would probably just be spam. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> It might be. We'll stick around. We're going to come right back with final phone calls. If you need to email me, I haven't given you that out yet tonight. Those of you who are brand new to the program, it's George at com. Constantinos' website is with his name, with a K, Constantinos.com. Well, on our next Coast to Coast program, we're going to start the first hour with another one of our great American success stories Americans who have started something out of their mind, just a thought, and went on to create jobs and a lot of things for Americans. That'll be our success story. You know, we had uh, David Oreck on a few months ago. We've got another guest for you tomorrow night. And then the rest of the program, we're going to be talking about huge shifts in the Earth's tectonic plates. I mean huge. What does it all mean? A geologist will explain on Coast to Coast AM. Constantinos, you've dabbled in magic. Is that, uh, I don't know, is it is it a cult? Is magic a cult? Well, yeah, occult um, just means hidden. And magic is definitely um, a hidden science. It's something that most people don't uh, know about. It's something that the, the true practice of is sort of secret, which is why the word occult is used. Is it playing with people's minds? Uh, no. No, it's um, it's basically playing with your own, if you will. It, it's um, manipulating your own mind to access the latent abilities that normally are lying dormant. We're working on trying to get Chris uh, Angel on the program, and it is uncanny. You do have a resemblance to him, and you sound a lot like him. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if he's from this planet. <laughs> yeah, he you is. know, he, the guy's incredible. He's he's one of the um, one of the guys who immediately will point out that what he does is purely natural. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> you do. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, there was a scene where he came walking into a room with a small suitcase, said he had to pick up his mother at the airport, and she popped out of the suitcase. Yeah. And there's no way a human being could fit in that suitcase. How could it? It's an illusion, but how can they do that to us? <laughs> yeah, I... I... I don't like to, um, Do you know when, that, when it's done for entertainment, I don't like to reveal how it's done. You know how it's done, though. Yeah, but it spoils it. Is it um, brilliant? He He's absolutely brilliant. There is no one more cutting edge than he is. Does a, mu- does a magician that creates those kinds of illusions, I mean, is there, a, is there a book? Do they go to school for it? Or do they create these illusions themselves, almost like an architect would create a building in, in his or her own mind? The uh, the principles are very few for stage magic, and um, the reason they're important to learn because they can be used to trick people in dishonest ways as well. And there, there's just a few. Did you see the movie The Illusionist? Yeah, definitely. Another one, right? Yeah, that was that was a good one. Uh, yeah. I like that. I like the short story too. Um, I think Milhauser's stuff is really great. Yeah. All right, to the phones we go. East to the Rockies. You're up with us. Hi there. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. This is Josh in Athens, Georgia. Hey, Josh. Hey, um, I've uh, I've had a uh, experience with uh, battling an entity myself. I'm a um, water shaman, uh, Wiccan, and uh, well, I, I thought I could take care of it myself. You know, I wasn't. Uh, you know, I thought I was strong, like like you were saying. You know, how you think you there won't be a problem with the Ouija board, right, but uh, right. let's just say it didn't uh, work out right, and now I'm. Uh, Kind of, I'm, you know, doing the right thing now and uh, going at it about the right way. But uh, my point is, I, w- I want to know if uh, Constantinos will uh, 
you know, talk about this is uh, the same kind of invocation I'd use to pull this out of me to fight it is the same kind of t t general kind of invocation you're going to be using with the Ouija board and uh, with the advertisement that you've been putting out for uh, for it. It's uh, it's definitely going to be a gathering place for uh, a lot of bad things to come out and kind of unleash. And I'm thinking maybe, uh, you know, trying to look out for you a little bit. Uh, oh, you know, I know you have a priest, but uh, maybe if you had like a circle and uh, some experienced uh, either pagans or Wiccans that would uh, come in and represent the elements and kind of help if anything really bad comes out of it. What do you think, Constantinos? Well, what's what's interesting, uh, you brought up the circle. Um, a circle is, is always a good idea for uh, an occult ritual, and there's a reason. If created properly in your mind, it sort of seals in what you want inside the circle and keeps out what you want to keep out. It's sort of a, a thought form that works on a grand scale. It creates a I mean, it's been called a sacred space, but it's not necessarily a religious thing. Um, it is sort of like a magical technology thing. So, yeah, circle, um, having some kind of control, it's a good idea, even, even just to sort of help focus your mind on what you're doing. I mean, not only just the, the circle, but, uh, you know, I, I did that too, and then it, it, without the help of others, you know, which is what I'm going to be doing next, then it's really... You know, with the with the kind of things that could be happening there, it it couldn't hurt to have others there that know what they're doing that to, to handle this. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he is going to have someone there, right? Yeah, so, well, I'll be surrounded by him. Yeah, so it sounds like he's kind of got that covered. Um, and also keep in mind that people have been, I'm sure, thinking negative thoughts about it, and people have been thinking positive thoughts about it. And let's hope they thinking, counterbalance each other. Exactly, it really does kind of work out that way. You know, that, that's why um, if you were to come up with a website, uh, project to discover the location of Osama bin Laden or something, it probably wouldn't work because there would be a group of radicals who would who are always thinking about protecting the location, for example. Right. You know, it, right. it, would, um, it would sort of cancel each other out, even on something of an epic scale like that, where everyone would love to find him, let's say, over here, but there'd be a group of evil people who would want just the opposite. First time caller line, you're up with us. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Corrine in Dallas, and I just bought your book, Narchernicon, uh, because of the section on Cthulhu, mm -hmm. because I make Cthulhu statues to sell on eBay, <laughs> and several of my friends, even the pagan ones, say they're worried for my soul, and I was worried, wondering, is there a reason they ought to be, and if so, what I should do about it? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I get asked about uh, the green guy every once in a while. Uh, well, basically, if you uh, believe that he was created by H.P. Lovecraft, which the evidence does seem to indicate, uh, most likely what he is is a very well-believed in and eerily enough loved uh, thought form, a thing that uh, people have played around with in role-playing games, video games, read books about, seen movies about. And he's taken on his own reality, just like other egregores and thought forms. So really what he is is this giant hunk of energy that people feed into and take from and think about and dream about. Um, and it, he's his own experience. Now, why that would have anything to do with your soul really doesn't um, make any sense. You, know? um, you, you can, I'm sure, sleep well at night knowing that you're not going to spend eternity in an underwater city uh, change at some altar by Cthulhu. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you still there? She's gone. Uh oh, I guess he got her. She's gone. They got her. West of the Rockies. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Um, I have a, I guess, some, I believe that I have came up with a theory to m manipulate people's energy. How so? Well, see, like, tell me what you think about this. Like, if you lie to somebody and they're, they, you know, they're, they're believing that lie. They're putting their energy into that belief. So how would that work? You know, like, uh, say I want to say, okay, I'm a millionaire. And then you tell these, you know, you tell people, and they're like, oh, this guy's rich, you know. So they're feeding into that belief. They're, you know, they're contributing their energy to that belief. Like, would uh, could that be manifested? Uh, it's interesting. Something like that could backfire. Like, I, I see where you're going with this. Like, it, it would be kind of neat, right, to have everyone do the work for you, to sort of just say it, say it, say it, and have everyone believe it, and then have them sort of will it into being for you. 
But keep in mind that most people aren't all that altruistic. So if if you brag about some house you don't have or whatever, 